Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm Mark Crispin Miller. Uh, this is news from underground for, uh, for May. It's actually May Day. And there's a huge uh, demonstration going on in the streets of New York. N not by the time you watch this, but it is going on. Uh, tonight's event is sort of an unusual one for us. Uh, what we usually do is, is uh, a panel on some kind of um, political subject uh, including authors whose books have either been uh, unfairly attacked or unjustly ignored, and, and News from Underground is here to give that kind of author a forum and, and our uh, audiences a chance to hear them speak. Tonight is a little bit different. Um, we're uh, going to focus more on uh, cultural issues of a very unusual kind. Uh, both of our authors tonight uh, have new books out in a series called Discovering America from the University of Texas Press. Uh, I am the editor of that series, so I'm ab abusing my prerogative by having these people come and, and speak. Uh, we're we're, we're going to talk about um, the, the dark side of what was once regarded as a kind of utopian vision of America as a, a land of... Uh, absolute freedom, perfect mobility, uh, specifically uh, the world of the highway. Uh, Ginger Strand is uh, the author of K a Killer on the Road, which is a fascinating uh, look at the weird convergence of the rise of the U.S. highway system with the emergence of the serial killer. Uh, and Josh Ozersky is uh, the author of uh, Colonel Sanders and the American Dream. Uh, not as dark a book as Ginger's, but uh, not unrelated. Um, so w this is very, very loose. Uh, we're simply going to uh, you know, talk and see what happens. So uh, Ginger, if you'll just begin. <laughs> just so just tell tell, tell sure. them about your book because uh, sure. it's such a, a fascinating one. Um, the first question I always get when I'm talking about the book is, uh, why did you write a book about serial killers and the highway system? How did, how did this topic occur to you? Were you just sitting around one day and suddenly you went, wow, serial killers on the highways? Um, and the answer to that is uh, that I actually was interested in writing a book about the interstate highway system because my particular obsession is infrastructure. And I started looking into the highway system. And I started learning more about the highway system and the ways in which it had transformed the nation and, in many ways, our psyche. And um, I can talk about some of the surprising things I discovered there. But one of the things that, that came up was that there was this figure constantly of the highway killer, of the hitcher, or the killer on the road in the Doors song, um, the uh, murderous guy who drives around picking up hitchhikers and kills them, the guy who, who goes up and down the highways and takes advantage of families who've had car trouble. And I started seeing this, this trope reappearing again and again in books and movies and things like that. And, and so I thought, well, is this based on something real? And one night I just you know, did a Google brand web search and um, found uh, on the term freeway killer and discovered that there were many, many men who had this um, name, free, the, the freeway killer, you know, the so-called freeway killer of I-40, the corridor killer of Delaware, the I-5 killer. There are three guys who have the, the name the I-5 killer. And so I started looking into the actual killers who've haunted the interstate and thinking about how uh, violence in, in the U.S. actually took a big uh, leap in the 1960s as the interstate highway system was being constructed. And looking at the convergence of this, this particular way of thinking about the world and, and the way we wanted to shape our nation, and then this other thing that was going on, the dark side of that dream, which is really the dark side of mobility, um, anonymity and rootlessness, and that, those kinds of things. Um, 
So it's a book both about real highway killers and every chapter it kind of centers on a particular killer and uh, follows his career and every chapter actually looks at a particular period in the construction of the highway system. So you're, you're getting your, your history of the interstate highway system, um, but there is a very high body count at the same time. Um, I discovered a lot of surprising things about the interstate highways that um, maybe because I'm not a very good historian or not very well educated, but that I, I didn't know as I was researching the book. Um, the first is that the highway system had nothing to do with the Cold War. It was not at all an, um, desired for purposes of civil defense. Um, Eisenhower very um, deliberately used the idea of, of national defense in order to sell the program in to Congress and get it um, you know, put, put through. In fact, in 1955, when they tried to pass the um, Federal Aid Highway Act, they called it an act for creating a system of national um, interstate highways, and it failed. Next year, they renamed it, they rebranded it, the National System of Interstate and Defense Highways and it succeeded. What they were really looking for was a stimulus. They were looking for a shovel-ready project that would um, hand out um, economic growth. Interestingly, they weren't looking for a project that would create jobs necessarily. They weren't looking to hand that growth to um, workers or people. They were looking to hand that growth to the auto industry, to uh, car makers. Um, asphalt makers, bridge builders, construction companies like Bechtel. Um, the, it was a, uh, economists have subs subsequently called it the first trickle-down um, entitlement for corporations. And it is the beginning in many ways, as the 1950s were, of this kind of program in the United States. Um, I learned a lot of other interesting things about the highways uh, while I was working on the book that surprised me. Um, but maybe I'll, I, I'll just finish by saying that uh, I also nearly killed myself on the interstate highway system while I was working on the book. I was at the Eisenhower Library, actually, in Abilene, Kansas, trying to um, figure out you know, how the highway system had come about, and, and I had uh, ironically, a suitcase full of Xeroxes in my trunk, and I was racing to the airport in Kansas City to try to get home in an ice storm, and just went crazily spinning off the road and, and I thought you were going to say, a, I, a man came along to give me a ride. <laughs> nope, nope. But, you know, I, I crashed my rental car, and... Um, the fascinating moment there was that as I was sitting in the median, the median having stopped the spinning car and dragged it to a halt and done everything that the highway engineers intended for highways, interstate highways to do, I realized, oh, right, there's this other side. You know, these highways are incredibly great uh, in some way. They are very safe. Um, and yet we, we persist in thinking of them as violent and dangerous. Um, and I think that comes not out of the reality of the highway, which actually made driving much safer in this nation, but it comes out of our, our sense of misgiving about the world that the highways represent, the world of uh, an economy that's based on, on growth and handouts to, since this is May Day, I'll say the 1%. <laughs> Did you have well, it was a rental car. That was the beauty of it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ginger, could you talk a little bit more about uh, the figure that people were haunted by? Uh, you know, why why this particular obsession with uh, the the rootless wandering killer? Maybe you could talk specifically about Charles Starkweather, sure. the first such figure in the fifties, and so on. Yeah, so many people have heard of Charles Starkweather, or if you haven't heard of Charles Starkweather, you've probably um, heard of someone similar. He's the guy that Terrence Malick's film Badlands is based on. Bruce Springsteen's song Nebraska um, is about Starkweather. He uh, went on a killing spree across Nebraska with his 14-year-old girlfriend in 1958, 
and um, he ended up uh, shooting 11 people before he was caught. The Nebraska governor called out the National Guard. They tracked him across the state. He was finally run down in Wyoming by a couple of Wyoming cops and, and sent back to stand trial in Nebraska. Um, he and his girlfriend were both convicted of murder and uh, she got life in prison. He got uh, the death penalty. Um, at the time, the nation's react, he was of course headline news all across the nation and everyone was just gripped by this case because it's a couple of teen killers on the run, you know, and, and uh, it turned out that they had in fact murdered a very prominent couple in, in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, the the uh, husband in that pair was one of the leading figures in the highways in the uh, highway program in Nebraska. He was the owner of a company called Capital Bridge, and they were building bridges for the new I-80. Um, but people's reaction to Charles was that you know, oh, he he's a juvenile delinquent. He's somehow representative of a way that America's gone wrong. We've we've gone down the wrong path. We're becoming this society that's rootless and materialistic and violent and militaristic and the and you know we think of the 50s as this time of conformity but in fact there was a lot of misgiving about what was happening and what what the kind of nation we were building and people wrote in to the newspapers i found it fascinating looking at all this um contemporary reaction to the starkweather case where people wrote in and said well, it's no wonder these people went, you know, driving across shooting people because all we care about is our cars. We just keep making these bigger, fancier cars and, and we're not teaching values anymore. So there was this, um, this kind of massive outpouring of, of anxiety and, and almost shame about where the nation was going that, that then very quickly, you know, got, got papered over once you can convict Charles Starkweather and execute him in the electric chair, then you've kind of solved your problem and you don't have to think about it much anymore. Okay. Um, I want to read something to introduce your remarks, okay? Because, you, you, Ginger, you just spoke about a, uh, a kind of a forgotten moment of, of, of anxiety uh, and, and um, introspection you know, in a moment that we don't think of as having an, entailed that kind of a mood, right? Because mm -hmm. we, we have a kind of stereotypic view of, of America in the 50s. Um, speaking of, of, of forgotten anxieties, this is an amazing um, editorial from the New York Times in February of 1975. And you'll see how this connects with, with your uh, part of this evening. Um, believe it or not, in the early 70s, as, as McDonald's tried to open outlets in New York City, there were protests, there were protests, and the New York Times was sympathetic to those protests, okay? And it's hard to believe now because there are over 340 McDonald's in, in New York and we just accept McDonald's as part of the urban landscape, fast food places generally. Well, in the, se in the early 70s, this, this would have been immediately regarded as, as a preposterous notion because these places were associated uh, with with the suburbs, and with what they call the open road, right? Uh, this is called the Battle of the Burger. I'm not going to read you the whole thing, but um, it's it's a completely sympathetic uh, uh, reflection on the undimmed opposition from almost every neighborhood threatened with the blessings of Burger King and its brothers. Okay, and uh, they're talking about uh, the the absolute contradiction between the spirit of a city with its with its with its individualistic uh, uh, texture and so on, and these fast food places, which are all about uh, you know a kind of uh, industrial rationality and replaceability. It is not a question of aesthetics or decorum or the goodwill of the franchisee. Uh, the promise of voluntary policing or cleanup or changes in design to make fast food outlets more acceptable neighbors are beside the point. What is fatal to city residential neighborhood character is the mass market formula itself with its high volume turnover and mass produced plastic image that sabotages individuality and a sense of place. This is the New York Times, okay? <laughs> Conclusion. Fast food places are neighborhood busters before one burger is bitten or one redundant wrapper dropped. It is a matter of scale, style, and standards that are destructively incompatible with the urban fabric and functions. They simply do not cut the mustard in New York. Now, as a historical note, 
you know, one wonders what happened to that protest. Where'd it go? You know, why did people suddenly stop protesting? And the answer is uh, Ronald McDonald houses. The rise of the Ronald McDonald house uh, uh, was a game changer because nobody's going to knock a company that, that builds such places for sick children and their parents. And you can see it. It's, it's evident just from reading the Times coverage of the Ronald McDonald houses that they built in New York. It's highly sympathetic. And it's, it's, there's just simply no way to criticize that. And it was a brilliant move, you know, much smarter than the architectural changes they tried to make in the Golden Arches and so on. It, it really killed the, the whole spirit of the protest. Well, anyway, Josh's book is about Colonel Sanders, who, who seems to be, in a way, a completely antithetical to the corporate uh, enterprise of, of fast food. Uh, so this is kind of your subject, so well, why don't you reflect I think on it, that? It's, it speaks directly to the, the sort of cultural anxieties that Ginger is talking about, because the burgeoning infrastructure of the American highway system, the, the rise of the suburbs, the invention of television, um, the rise of uh, the corporate state and the Eisenhower administration, all these things were contemporaneous expressions of a homogenizing tendency in American life and American culture, which filled people simultaneously with hope and dread Hope, because as Eisenhower had rightly believed, it would in fact lead to a more robust economy and, and so on, and as it did. And then at the same time that, you know, by widening the arteries between American hamlets, that it would uh, inevitably uh, destroy, uh, erase, and undo the individual character, which was the United States' original reason for being. And the, the colonel was a kind of a paradoxical and transitional figure in all that, much as was somebody like, say, Robert Moses or Charlie Starkweather or any number of other people that are identified with the crisis of modernity in the 50s and 60s. Like, the colonel was someone who represented an older America, right? A regional America, actually not even small town, but pre-urban, and his original experience ran directly uh, against the energies of the, the freeway and of the, the great depersonalization and interpenetration of, of the American city-states. Like, when the colonel, you know, got started, he had a motel in Corbin, Kentucky. It's like a little place, tiny, out of the way, and he had a gas station that became a motel, and he made his chicken, and Duncan Hines went, and there was actually a Duncan Hines, unlike, like the colonel, was also a real person, and he wrote a guidebook. He was like the first like foodie, road food guy, and he wrote a, a book, and he he noted its excellent ham, its uh, chicken, uh, its steak, gravy, and biscuits, and um, that was about as as famous as the colonel was. Far from being an icon, he didn't even have a white suit, and um, it was only when his restaurant was was ruined his and his life his life's work completely destroyed and and himself reduced to penury that he began to develop himself as an antebellum icon and interestingly the very instrument of his undoing was the national highway the Wait, before you go on tell, just tell him the story of who he was and, and he wore a white suit and sold fried chicken. No. <laughs> the colonel, the colonel, colonel Sanders was... Uh, was he a colonel? Yeah. He was a Kentucky... Well, the, a Kentucky colonel is like, you know, that's like, that's like a, a meaningless political, you know, like, I proclaim today, you know, Gary Carter of the Mets Day, you know, like... Um, the colonel was um, a hustler, an entrepreneur, a small businessman. He had failed at a million different jobs. And then late, you know, in, in the middle of his life, he had found some success with a, a, a gas station that became a motel and that sold chicken. And then, you know, I had built this up very dramatically, Mark. You really pulled the... the you, you better pipe down. Okay, sorry. So anyway, the, the, the instrument of his undoing was, in fact, the very American highway that we're talking about because... 
you know, like Norman Bates, he had the unfortunate experience of having the highway moved out from under him. The whole, the whole lifeblood of what he was doing was was a a, count, a, a state road in Kentucky that he he hoped would become linked to the interstate. And then what happened was some larger, more impersonal, more well-funded uh, source than himself was able to lobby the state government to move mm -hmm. the, the, the interstate north, and that completely left him broken. So what he did at that point was to reinvent himself as a colonel, put on a white suit. You, he had been given that award, like, cause like you know, the colonel, like the governor of, of Kentucky had stopped in his restaurant and, you know, eating chicken. It's like, this is like, this is delicious. I proclaim you a Kentucky colonel, you know. And he went around in a car in the back roads of the state to other people who had been left behind by, by modernization. Shitty diners, little roadside greasy spoons, backwater eateries. And he would go in there, he'd say, I have, I'm Colonel Sanders, I make this chicken. He'd make them the chicken. He'd say, I'll make you a deal. I'll sell you my original recipe breading and a pressure cooker, and you give me a nickel of every chicken, and you can call it Colonel Sanders Kentucky Fried Chicken. So he was creating a brand among other dispossessed people. And then the great paradox of his life was that he then... Excuse me, what year was this? This would have been uh, 19, uh, let's say 1960. I guess it was 1960 when the when he lost his restaurant, and then there was a a period of about. Well, actually, no. It was he was 65 when he lost the restaurant, which would have been 1955. Yes. Yeah, so there was there was a period of like five years that he went around doing this, and he, uh, oh, in the early 60s, uh, found himself um, with the opportunity. You know, there was a high-powered Kentucky lawyer, the son of the governor, um, you know, big money investors, and they wanted to get that action. They wanted to get that old-time chicken, that old regional, you know, street cred. Because, you know, as, as inevitably happens, like when they build new developments, they're named for the things they replace, right? Mm -hmm. So when, um, when Kentucky Fried Chicken became incorporated and subsequently rationalized, tailorized, standardized, reproduced exactly in hundreds and thousands of units across hundreds of thousands identical towns, uh, it was given uh, the kind of you know, moral and historical authority that only an old man from the older America could have. And so the colonel became uh, simultaneously the beneficiary of, of this change, but also its victim, because he was unmanned in a very real way. He didn't control the company anymore. He, he was just a, 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 in the very purest sense of the term, a figurehead, uh, an icon. And his job was to uh, you know, walk around in his white suit, wave at people weekly in parades, and basically you know, look dumb and act stupid. And he rebelled against that to his credit to the end of his life, but um, there was really nothing he could do about it. And both his culture and the culture his chicken represented uh, were quickly subsumed into the, you know, the very things that you know, were the antithesis of, of his entire uh, life. I don't know exactly how, if that, but I think that, yeah. I think it, both, both our books speak to the, the profound ambiguity of uh, the highway system in America, you know, because nothing could be more American than the love of of mobility. I mean, that's what we say, Colonel Sanders and the American dream, right? The American dream is the opportunity to transcend your place, right. not just your place in the social class, but your place in physical space, which often it means the same thing. Orwell once said, in America, uh, you know, unlike here, a guy could punch his boss in the nose and go move west, and, you know. Right. So the, the highway system simultaneously made it possible to do that or Charlie Stark, whether to go bump people off and whatever and keep running. But then on the other hand, the more it gets developed, you know, the longer the road is, the more toll booths and, and checkpoints it has, I guess. And also the more of a compulsion it has to create, to recreate 
a falsified sense of place, which is exactly what it what Kentucky Fried Chicken ultimately does. Right. I mean, it's Kentucky Fried Chicken, right? So it's this this southern thing. It's associated with a particular you know regional cuisine and and a regional you know look and feel that you know comes from the founder, but it seems you know is not is ultimately like the fictions that companies today make up, like Abercrombie and Fitch, say, or Victoria's Secret, they all have these stories that are written by, you know, anthropologists who, you know, about the founding of their company that are completely false. And it's interesting that that, that starts with a guy who's real, but whose story is then falsified. But his, his sense of place needs to be, you know, lifted off of him and, and slathered onto this thing because one of the scariest things what about the highway system is it is the placelessness right. of it and when you're in it when you're in in what you know what we call interstatia which is like the 51st state you know it's the state we all know how it works and it, it looks the same no matter what state you're in interstatia and you can count on it to function in the same way and you can count on a kentucky fried chicken to offer you the same kind of experience that you would have in another place um but that's that is what contributes to that sense of dread in a way is because it's a place that's not a place. Yeah, really a kind of a kind of uh, I know me uh, and existential, where you, you know. Where you are not a person. Yeah, that's I right. mean the scare. The interesting thing uh, that, that I started thinking about working on this book and it's, it's kind of what happened to Colonel Sanders is what the interstate does to everyone. You are ultimately you're a license plate number when you're on the road and it, when people I, find that liberating though it can be very live hitchhike your way across the usa you know and you can become a completely different person but at the same time people who are forced to spend their entire lives in it like the truckers i i talk about this epidemic of trucker serial killers um in my last chapter that's going on now and um what was fascinating hearing the truckers talk is the way in which they they feel that they're uh, to their dispatcher they're a number, to the uh, to their employers they're a, a cargo, they feel that they've merged with the machine, and it's very easy for them to just become you know if they start off a little bit sociopathic it's easy for them to just go right over that cliff. It's true. I mean, I I remember. An especially poignant expression of that being the, the brief CB radio craze of the 1970s. Yeah. Was this, this kind of, this this this, abortive attempt for them to kind of create a community, mm -hmm. you know, with each other? Just, you know, then that just became a you know a fad. Yeah. You know, too. It's interesting. I I was watching, you know, my I'm a big fan as you know, Mark, of Johnny Mercer. Mm -hmm. The great songwriter, I, I think the greatest of all American songwriters. And in the Harvey Girls, the nineteen the nineteen forty four MGM musical, the Harvey Girls, there's a, an incredible nine minute musical sequence, a real tour de force of um, the, the song the the Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe. And it's it's this incredibly moving celebration of tra trains, but really what it's about is is the the mystery of mobility and transformation and there's this incredible thing where like all these different girls Harvey girls you know they were like the Harvey girls were they were like basically waitresses or, or hostesses that were recruited for you know um, one of the first inter uh, interstate um, hospitality businesses and you know they all want you know they come from the they come and they talk about the different states they're from oh I'm from Ohio Ohio you know um, and, uh, and, you know, it, it's suffused, though, with the glory and mystery of the trains, and there's this incredible, like, automatopedic rhythm, you know, and Judy Garland comes out, and, like, it builds up, and the, you, then you see the gleaming train, and everyone's walking, and, and the bursts of steam from the train is, like, timed with the choruses. It's an incredible thing, and it, it you know, when you... It makes you kind of appreciate vicariously what it must have been like for people that were stuck, you know, in 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 small towns or farm. Towns. The idea of like something that could just come, you know, out of nowhere, you know, so fast, so clean, so modern, cut off from everything, and just 
offer a, an instantaneous root of transformation and transcendence and how deeply and profoundly American that is. I mean, going back all the way to the first colonies, you know? Yeah. It ended up being a betrayal and a gyp like so much else of the American promise, but well, it goes I, yeah. very deep. I grew up on a farm. I mean, and I, I loved I-94 because that was my, you know, long gray ticket out of town. That was, that was what connected me to Chicago. And that was, you know, that stood for a better life. That's just it. That's the crucial thing. I mean, this is, we're talking about a kind of an iconic longing, right? Because we all know the story of Nixon as a child listening to the train whistle at night, you know, because it, it, it would mm -hmm. offer a kind of deliverance from that kind of uh, suffocating parochialism and so on. But the crucial thing is you're mentioning Chicago. In other words, this myth uh, has a tremendous power and attractiveness as long as we assume that the highway is going to take us somewhere. Right. right. Usually a, long, a city. <laughs> uh, it's usually a city. It's some other place. Yeah. The Harvey girls could each, you know, uh, do a turn talking about the state they're from, and the presumption is each state's sort of unique. Right. So, so the United States is this constellation of different places, all united in one. The United right? States. The United States, exactly. But something happens once you realize that the highway itself has displaced all the places, that it's just the highway experience itself that you're signing on for. It's not going to take you anywhere because anywhere you go is just the highway. You call it interstatia. Then it becomes something else. And that, I think, introduces the darkness into it because that kind of absolute freedom from place, from any kind of tie or connection or human contact, mm -hmm. somehow inevitably shades into a sort of sociopathic destructiveness. You know, mm -hmm. and I, I kind of wanted mm -hmm. to ask you why that is. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is it about the highway? You know, why, is it, why isn't it just a kind of blankness? Why does it have to be homicidal? You know <laughs> what I mean? What, what is that? Have you thought about that? Uh, you know, it's uh, one of the fascinating things to me looking at, say, the 60s, right? So the, in the 60s, the highways go into the cities, into the urban centers of the U.S., and they have a terrible, immediate terrible effect. And... Um, Eisenhower gets very upset. He's, you know, doesn't doesn't realize that this was part of the program. In fact, this was how his advisors sold the program to to Congress. So it can't be stopped. But it's clear that um, it's not going to be good for downtown. That it's it's causing uh, the entire not just white flight but the entire middle class to move out of the center cities. And then the interstates are literally used to wall off and close off the most benighted and desperate neighborhoods and turn them into urban ghettos. And at the same time, they would use the, um, the interstate programs to demolish uh, what they considered slums. And this, it was pretty nasty substandard housing, but these were communities that um, were functioning in some way. And people, a million people lost their homes in the first decade of interstate construction. Was this what, we, what was euphemistically called urban renewal? It was called urban renewal. It was euphemistically called Negro removal, actually. <laughs> and, uh, and, and what I never realized until I started working on this book is that the so-called, you know, urban uprisings or um, riots of the 60s, late 60s and early 70s were often sparked by interstate freeway construction. Oh in the cities. So um, in the black community called it white men's roads through black men's bedrooms. And they understood very clearly that this was just, you know, Jim Crow by way of, of, of road building and uh, fought it wherever they could, not, not successfully. And yet it's impossible not to remember that one of the great liberations for African Americans was the the great migration. The ability by, to by, move north, yeah. Right, the, the, the migration by car from the Deep South to uh, manufacturing centers like Chicago in the early part of the century. Right, but then once the highways came into the cities, the jobs moved to the uh, urban fringe and there was no transit. Transit had been taken out so that the jobs were at the, in the suburbs and it, it, it sped up the process of unemployment and um, misery in the ghettos. What was surprising to me to go back to, to Mark's question about why does this have to be violent, you know, murder, mayhem, looking at the actual statements of the highway engineers in the 1950s when they were thinking about what they were going to do. 
Their language was incredibly violent. They were saying, we're going to use this freeway to put a knife in the heart of the urban ghetto. We're going to use this freeway to slash through the slums of the city over and over and over. Um, they talked about, you know, we're going to strangle this neighborhood, you know, <laughs> until it stops causing us trouble. They, they literally, it was, it was part of the way they, I mean, and, and there are people who've said this is because this, this was sort of handed over to technocrats. This entire project was handed over to engineers who had a particular way of thinking about the world that was not humane right. in any, any real sense. Well, that, that imperial enterprise, I guess you could say, is, is ultimately based on a, on a kind of hostility to nature. You know, <laughs> I mean, I, I think of a quote, it has nothing to do with the highway per se, but it's from the 19th century. Uh, one, some politician was hailing the train, you know, the construction of the railroads, because the train would annihilate the magnificent distances. Think right. about that. Right, I mean, right. We, we love the magnificent distances, the Grand Canyon we're talking about, but the, somehow that impulse, that, that, that imperial impulse to subdue nature mm -hmm. fi found expression in, in those guys. Uh, yeah, in 1963, the California highway engineers, they wanted to, to run um, I-40 through the Bristol Mountains, only the Bristol Mountains were in the way, so they decided, Oh, oh, this is perfect. We'll drop 22 nuclear bombs on the Bristol Mountains. And they actually had this plan in place, and they were going to set up bleachers on a nearby mountain so that the, you know, Wait, they were gonna toity toities could come were, and sit and watch. When was it they were going to drop 22 atom bombs? Uh-huh, in 1963. But didn't they, they knew that atom bombs caused, you know, things to blow up. Oh, well, they please, want, they wanted details. To, it was just a mountain. <laughs> It's, a, it's staggering, isn't it? Is that really true? <laughs> it was. It was in the New York Times, <laughs> so it must be it true. Must be true. <laughs> it's funny, but the fact is that it, it's really not that different from mountaintop removal. Of, right. You know, I mean, today, except for the radio. If, if if an enemy, if an enemy nation dropped a bomb on an American mountain, I mean, the the leadership would be so aghast at the physical destruction of America. Right. But when it's done by us to make, a, you know, you know, to pave over paradise and put up a parking lot or whatever, I mean, the the same sort of millennial march of progress line of patter that was sold to the American public by Ike is still alive and well and and continuing to throttle what remains of, you know, regional American personhood and everything. But I don't know. Maybe it's for the best. You know, maybe we all should just get with the program. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, no, that, that's a point. One could say that. Uh, on the other hand, maybe not. I mean, I mean, these this program is acceptable only to those who aren't affected by it. You know, who stand above it and prescribe it to others. Right? Well, I, I think we need to ask to be honest about this. Do we really want? I mean, what's the alternative to not have good roads? I mean, to have it be like. To have it be like you know the the interior of China. No, see that's how people always. By that's that's how people always tend to think about infrastructure, and it's so it's 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 kind of broken. Once it's here, it's like, well, what's our choice to go back to the Stone Age? No, we had some great infrastructure for transportation before we had the interstate highway system. We had a railroad system. We had a small a light rail system of electric very small electric trains that ran over every Midwestern state, connected every podunk little town in the entire, you know, Midwest. My grandparents sent their, you know, three canisters of milk every day to the next town over by, by uh, what was called the interurban. You know, we, we had a different set, a different set of infrastructure for transit. We tore it up and we put down highways. We could tear them up and put down something else. You know, you can always change. Actually, our postal roads system was the envy of, of the world. You know, I mean, um, Tocqueville talked about it. I mean, that's what enabled the United States to thrive politically was the creation of a newspaper system. Uh, and the post office, you know, allowed printers in one state to send their newspapers free to printers in, in other states, you know. And that's how the country was kind of knit together, and it was based on there was an infrastructural dimension to this because there were postal roads that were really there was nothing like that in Europe, 
you know, there would be no way to get the mail to another part of Germany or something like that. So it, it's true that, it, you know, once we start to, to talk about the new thing, we assume that there was nothing but savage wilderness until it was created, right? So, so the question isn't like, what should we go back to, sort of a Chinese wilderness? I, I think it, it, I would suggest that what we have to do is ask the question of at what point does the system become an end in itself? You know, at what point does the highway itself become its sort of its own purpose? If you see what I mean, yeah. mm -hmm. as opposed to for something, as opposed to something that's supposed to serve us. Yeah, and, and, and many people are talking in these terms today. A lot of a lot of people who talk about transit talk about the fact that you need to think about not road building or road repair, but where are people going? Where do they need to get? And how can we get them there most efficiently and and safely? Um, so I think that it's 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 always possible. You know, it reminds me a lot of what my late friend and mentor Neil Postman from NYU used to say he had like a list of like six questions that should be posed towards any new technology that were like profound and value neutral questions that are almost never asked such as what problem is this a solution to mm -hmm. what problems is it likely to cause who does it benefit who does it not benefit I think that in a secular in a secular state like America, which has, is, and always will be an essentially secular state, there's an almost um, theistic reverence for physical progress. You know, you think of um, Henry Clay's American system, you know, with capital letters and internal improvements and so forth, less mm -hmm. grandiose term, but I mean, and even today, I mean, when you hear Democrats, you know, so offer their plans for the future. It's always like, we need to invest in high-tech education, you know? I mean, it's always like right. the march of progress. Right. So maybe Charlie Starkweather had it right. <laughs> There's also the, you know, it was it was actually Nixon who, who detached uh, the Highway Trust Fund from roads and allowed some small, you know, portion of it to go to transit. Um, but Did you know really? you do yeah it was Nixon you do build a monster when you when you do something like 9010 financing you, you start creating a, a mobile strip of money that no one is gonna be willing to turn off yeah so you have to think not just about the technology itself but how it's being uh, funded and propagated right uh, do we have any questions from the floor or comments yeah Jolie um, well, first on the music thing, um, to me, uh, the ultimate road song is uh, Route 66 by Chuck Berry. You know, from, yeah, great song. You know, um, uh, you know, I came here from England in uh, 83, really. I moved and I went to California and I was amazed at the difference in the attitude between Europeans and, and Americans just for driving, where, you know, in Europe it was a very engaged activity and, and here in in America, it was a kind of like disengaged activity where people didn't really pay a lot of attention when they were driving down roads to, you know, it was a very, very casual. I was kind of amazed at that, you know, and I got, to, I got a busted for tailgating because I was, uh, you know, driving in an engaged fashion. Uh, but uh, another thing that's remarkable was how much cheaper gasoline was. You know, here it was a dollar, or, at that time it was a dollar a gallon or something, whereas in Europe it was four dollars, you know, all the taxes and everything, and it's a, so it's a remarkable freedom. There's also the, 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 the amount, the amount of, uh, you know, that you could drive because you could afford to, people could afford to drive here. Um, and, but uh, my question is, speed limits, what, uh, were the speed limits in the 50s? When did they introduce speed limits on the road? Do we have to repeat your question for the no. sake of the video? Okay. Uh, the speed limit was introduced along with the interstate highway system. It always had a speed limit. Um, it was 70 miles an hour at the beginning because the design speed of the interstate highway standards is 70 miles an hour. So the road is meant to be safe at that speed. Um, 
you know, those of us who drive on the parkways around New York City, the Taconic, say, or the um, Merritt, or whatever, you know, some other parkways, the sawmill, the design speed of those parkways is 45 miles an hour. So when you're on that parkway and everybody's going 70 and it's, it's an absolutely terrifying experience, yeah. then you realize, oh, this is why the interstate is good, because it actually is designed to go that fast. Was so. also, a, wasn't, um, wasn't it inspired by Ike's exposure to the Autobahn during the war? That's the great story that Ike liked to tell. Um, and he would say, you know, we need a highway system like the Germans because I saw this great high with this great Autobahn. Ike actually used the Autobahn to get to Berlin <laughs> quicker. You know, he couldn't have seen it as a, as a military advantage. It was actually quite a disadvantage to the Germans that they had this, um, this highway system. Um, and far, far uh, more of the war was dependent on uh, the ability of Americans to put together, you know, destroyed railroads and get trains running again and to get, uh, they, they just didn't have that many things that could go on roads. Um, but he did think it was pretty cool. I mean, and, and that is another interesting um, underlying fact when you think about, you know, is the, what is the aesthetic of the interstate? It's basically the aesthetic of a particular brand of modernism that was embraced by the National Socialists. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. yeah. When you say, uh, Jolie, driving is an engaged activity in Europe, you're, you're talking about, I mean, in part, the difference between uh, automatic and it's manual it's transmission, it's right? But, yes. But, yeah. But more so, I mean, I, mean, I didn't only notice about driving, I noticed about television and other things as well. You know, they do engaged viewing in Europe? Yeah. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> what is engaged viewing? Yeah. Like people have it on like the radio in the background here in America. Oh, I see. Like sit down with programs and That's true. Europe. They do that in Italy too. TV's always on. People yeah. are starting to study what happens, you know, what happens to your brain on driving. And it does do interesting and bizarre things to your brain when you drive um, that are probably amplified in, in America. Um, it, it detaches you from... Um, being acknowledged by, you know, we're herd animals. We long to be acknowledged. We long, you know, if I look at you, you you're nodding because we're having this little exchange like you're a person, I'm a person. It's cool. We're all cool. You know, when you're in a car and you're in the car in front of me, I don't see you as a person. And I know that you don't see me as a person. And actually, technically, if your car's in front of me, I'm kind of looking at your butt which is a position of, of submission to animals, right? And, and it often makes us a little bit crazy, and it's why we get so... Uh, so you're saying that ro road rage is a form of topping? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> I'm saying that on the road, we're all psychopaths. It, it pushes us in the direction of being psychopaths because we're not having the kind of human interactions and exchanges that constantly remind us to be uh, humane. So you just start thinking of that person ahead of you as a car and you need to get past them or you need, to, I don't know if this happens to everyone in the room, but it definitely happens to me on the road. I'm like, you know, yeah. And saying things that I would never say to you no matter how badly you behaved in say a bar, if you bumped into me and spilled a beer down me, I wouldn't be screaming what I might scream to you if we were on the Taconic next to each other. The other thing, you know, it's also interesting is that the behavior of of individuals on the road actually is studied more profitably using particle wave models in physics than it is any kind of psychological model. Like if everyone would go a certain speed, everyone would go a certain speed, but if you go two miles above that, then no one goes, you know what I mean? Are there, are there, or there's all these other weird patterns that, I mean, there's a whole field of, of study about it. And it's funny, too, because I just saw when I was walking down that E.O. Wilson has a new book about the conquest, of, the social conquest of Earth, about how social organisms functioned in concert. And you could make an argument for talking about how, how cars on a highway function as a kind of super organism, too, you know? Right. Not a human organism, though. No, more like an ant. Yeah. Do, do you think, uh, Ginger, that... Um, Serial murder, right? As we think of it now, 
I mean, obviously, there have always been people who are compulsive killers. I mean, that's mm -hmm. not a new thing, right? Mm -hmm. There was Gilles Duré in the Middle Ages, and yeah, uh, and M, you know, mm -hmm. is about, it's about a serial. Yeah, I mean, they were, they were right. That ex that's always existed as a pathology, but somehow, you know, the kind of um, sort of eruptive aggression ag against something you just want to pass, maybe mm -hmm. run off the road. It sounds more like a kind of compulsive serial murder that seems sort of modern. Do you think that's true? That that the these kinds of killers, in part, were a creation of the highway system. Um, I don't know if I'd go as far as to say that they're a creation of the highway system, but I would say that they might. You might call them an expression of the same sort of modernity that the highway system is an expression right. of. Um, it definitely was the case that the uh, phenomenon of the serial killer as we know it began or, or really took hold in the 1960s. Um, and the, the popular fascination at, you know, with serial killers took place at the same time or started to grow then and, and then really took off in the, in the 1990s. A lot of it, and it doesn't, it's true, it also, even when it's not on a highway per se and it tends to involve cars like Son mm -hmm. of Sam shot people in cars. The Zodiac pe killer shot people in cars. Mm -hmm. You know, killers yeah. are often associated with their car. Uh, Ted Bundy was known for driving a, a Volkswagen Bug that had the seat taken out so that he could fit a body in it. When they caught when they caught Son of Sam, he was on his way to a disco with his a trunk filled with machine guns. Was he really? Yeah. Oh. Yes. Yep. I mean, there, one of the interesting things, if you read the book Fast Food Nation, yes. is one of the most alarming things is like the number of McDonald's, the robbery rate on those mm -hmm. easy on, easy off, because the vault's the vault always in the same place. Right. So if you've worked at a McDonald's, which you know most kids have, they know where the safe is. Right. So you drive in, stick it up, and you drive away. Right. Yeah. That, the that, same thing if you want to like the wash that the sniper that. The, the mad marksman. The Washington sniper. Or whatever. Yeah, it was after 9/11. Right, but yeah. it's easy to get away. You, yep. you drive off. Right. And, and so it, it creates an opportunity. I don't know that it engenders the opportunity, but it makes it easy to, to go from place to place. Whereas maybe if you were a serial killer in the 18th century, you weren't quite as mobile. You know, if you're so you just had to kill everybody in your neighborhood. Yeah, but we had to make a distinction between robbery and, and murder because what you're talking about, you know, that easy escape route, I mean, I know, I remember, and I can't place it, but the, the fact of the highway, you know, feeding past these, you know, affluent suburbs, like I'm from the North Shore of Chicago, there was always a kind of worry about about that because people could drive up from some awful place. Right, know, right. And right. hit a house, right? Right. And then, and then disappear. Uh, off the, you know, take right, but in terms of like, you know, if you're going to be, if you've got a homicidal impulse, right. you want to, it's like, oh, you know what? You can, maybe some people want to take out everybody in their workplace. That's the going postal thing that's right. sort of popular. And then the, the other thought of just like, I'm just going to ride around and... Yeah, and well, the, this is a this is a very good point and an important point. And it's definitely what's happening with the truckers, the trucker serial killers, because... Uh, they have access to this um, large pool of anonymous um, prostitutes in the truck stops who are very easy to kill because they don't get reported missing a lot of the time. They're considered throwaway people by law enforcement. Um, so there's you know, just a, an absolute epidemic of that going on, and it's exactly because of that. Because uh, I went to a truck stop uh, with a, a really well-known criminologist, and we walked around, and he looked at it, and he said, "This this place is making this problem happen. The place is enabling because it's bringing together every crime is a convergence of three things: a victim, a a a, a criminal, and the lack of a protector of someone someone or something to stop it from happening." And so this is, you know, what's going on at the truck stops. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I, robbery and murder are very different, but right. it, it is a matter of, like, 
I think the, the opportunity the opportunity of that easy on easy off and maybe it is that lack of sense of place but it's just also well the the you person you can right, the right. see the, how to get out as you drive on and that's part of the the, right. the, the example you give, the mad right. marksman in Washington, is the really the, the consummate example of the mobile killer because he literally never left the car. Uh -huh. I mean, he, would, he, he just would shoot people from the trunk of the car, and sometimes I think he didn't, they didn't even stop the car. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, that's really the kind of terminus, I suppose, of it. Well, it's a deep it, topic. It, it is almost... It is always misogynistic, isn't it? I was just trying to think of a counterexample. I thought of Kathleen Warnos, you know? Eileen mm -hmm. Warnos. Eileen Warnos, right. But that was sort of a reaction against yeah. uh, misogynistic hostility, right? But, I mean, it, it, the subtext of this is men killing women, isn't it? Or men killing gay men. And, okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. So some of these um, serial killers... Uh, they killed gay men. That was their target. Yeah, two of the I five killers actually targeted right. gay men. Any other? Uh, could we go on all night. <laughs> well, the only other thing I wanted, because you talked about the train system, is there, it, it doesn't seem like you have to starve one transportation system to to do another. Because I mean, we do have an interest, in, and now the big thing is building airports. Because in a funny way, the interstates are no longer the glamour project. Now it's you build an airport because people fly in and mm -hmm. people don't even want to drive from, you know, Chicago to San Francisco. You fly. Everything is flyover land. So you just mm -hmm. jump over. But you don't have to start the, the railroad to have an interstate system. I don't think there's a... Yeah, and, the, and, and railroads that, make sense. Railroads make sense with a certain level of, of ridership and not in other places, you know. Railroads don't really make a whole lot of sense in the Western, you know, the big, vast Western states. So, yeah, you're right. It's, it's all about multimodal these days in the world of the, you know, the people who are actually thinking about this <laughs> instead of just building more roads. Do you want to say anything else? I have, I have nothing to add. That's it? I'll say a couple more things. Okay, go ahead, Charlie. Um, you know, about the idea of people start becoming, you know, changing as they get in the relationship with the machine. My favorite writer on this topic is John Steinbeck in The Sea of Cortez. And he writes about the hermit crabs, and, he, and then he likens them to the, to the Nazis in their tanks in Germany, you know, in 1942. And he really writes, writes about it well. Um, yes, he also writes about it very well in um, Travels with Charlie where he's driving around, the, it's his road trip book, and he's driving around the country with his dog Charlie, and he gets on the interstate for a while, and his head starts filling up with, and this speaks to what you were saying earlier about the way people drive in the U.S. You know, have you ever had the experience where you're just driving and you're, you're thinking and suddenly you realize that you're, you've, you've like gone 40 miles without noticing the 40 miles? It's like you went into this very heady place. And he gets on the interstate and his head starts filling up with thoughts and, and anxieties and all these, these things. And he says he has to get off the interstate because he can't stand being in his own head so much as he was on the interstate. And then he, he takes small U.S. highways for the rest of the trip. And then my last uh, question is about hitchhiking, which was something that sort of rose with the war and was very fashionable and you know, popular in the 50s and 60s. And was it, was it this kind of thing that you're talking about that led to the end of hitchhiking? Yeah. Yeah, it was, there's, I have a chapter on, on this, and um, hitchhiking in this was very popular in the 70s, and the, uh, in the, by the 80s it was pretty much closed down, and that was very consciously done by the FBI, uh, who disliked hitchhiking because student activists were using, uh, were hitchhiking, getting all over the country, getting to the South and registering voters and getting to protests. And, and um, there was a very strong law enforcement um, campaign to convince people that hitchhiking was dangerous. Was it, in fact, dangerous? No. How, how did they do this campaign? They, they were, Public they were... service announcements, um, police pa sending pamphlets, police actually walking up to women on the streets in the 70s who were walking alone 
or hitchhiking and handing them a, a little card that said, if I were a killer, you'd be dead now. Or, you know, be, be thankful I'm not a rapist. That's subtle. Subtle, yeah. So, and, and a lot of media coverage of the dangers of hitchhiking. Certainly there were a lot of, uh, of crimes that happened, robberies, rapes, and the occasional murder of hitchhikers. But if you look at how hitchhiking shot up in popularity in the 70s, the only study that was done to try to figure out whether there really was an, an, an increased danger to hitchhikers found that there was not. Hmm. But, you know, you wouldn't know that today. That's fascinating. You never see people hitchhiking. Uh, hitchhiking's completely over. I mean, when I was a kid, we used to hitchhike to school, right? Uh, this was in the like, 60s to high school. You can't imagine letting your kid hitchhike now, right? Right, right. I, I think people, right now, there's a whole, most of the young drivers wouldn't even know what the person was doing. <laughs> no, it's true. What does that mean? I, I what tried is to that? hitchhike Did recently. <laughs> I wouldn't do it. I was in California recently. I tried to hitchhike from one place to I was stuck. I was, uh, just needed to get somewhere quickly. And yeah, it was like, what is she doing? <laughs> you don't, I mean, you used to see people with signs, right? Yeah. But you don't ever see that. I mean, I can't think of ever seeing that. Do you, have you? Lately? I mean, no. in the last 10 years? Signs no. Are, you know, no. Maybe in Portland. With, or where they're going. You know? No, I know, but signs now, if you see someone with a sign, by a, even by a highway exit, they're panhandling. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, there were also yeah, there were also ordinances passed against it in many many states and many uh, municipalities. It was so crimin they criminalized it was criminalized. It. Yeah. In Nevada, in northern Nevada, the road across uh, going to California from Salt Lake, mm -hmm. uh, which I drove I drove cross country. I eighty. Yeah. Um, the signs along the road because it's pretty stark out there are. Do not pick up hitchhikers, high security prison area. Which is like, okay, so the guy has it. <laughs> yeah. Right. I don't need to be somebody's lift to their next uh, location, as it were. So a guy, guys would bust out of prison and then immediately start hitchhiking somewhere? I have no idea, but it's hard to it picture. It, <laughs> In the orange coveralls. Yeah, right. you know, like. yeah. Okay. Wow. All righty. Well, thank you for coming. And, um, you know, uh, this is a bookstore. And they are the authors of books. Uh, so if you want to buy copies of these, uh, and the authors will sign them, we, we, we strongly encourage it. Uh, but otherwise, thank you for coming. And thank you, guys. Thanks. It was great. Thank you for inviting us.